Hello, and welcome to today's lecture on IT governance. I'm Dr. Richard Ruth, and I will be talking about the four models of IT governance, along with some of the motivation for why you want to have a healthy, productive IT governance process um, in your company. So we start with a question. What are the biggest challenges that face a modern CIO? So when we start thinking about the challenges that face a modern CIO, um, there are several that start popping to mind. Um, one, funding is an issue. A lot of IT departments don't get the funding they need to have the strategic impact that they um, should be having. Another one is ownership and cooperation by the other CXOs in the company. Ownership of the major IT initiatives and the cooperation from them to cause those initiatives to become successful and used the way they ought to be used to get full business benefit out of them. Another challenge is participation and again, ownership in the prioritization decisions that face the company about what to do with the IT budget. Another challenge that faces CIOs oftentimes is just their stature as a leader in the strategic business planning activities in the company. A lot of CIOs um, don't see themselves, or the rest of the senior leadership team doesn't see them either, as a full uh, participating member of how strategic business planning is done in the company. Well, <clears throat> all of these are addressed in a splendid way by doing IT governance properly. If IT governance is done properly, your funding issues will go away. You won't, you won't be plagued with inadequate funding for the things that you think IT needs to be doing in the future. The other CXOs in the company will be fully vested owners of the IT initiatives that you want to see being successful on the part of the company. They will participate with you in the prioritization of how IT resources are being spent so that you're not in a fight with them over, sorry, I can't build what you've wanted me to build because I think this other thing is more important, or I've seen it go the other way. Okay, I'm going to build what you're asking me to build, even though I know that it would be better for the company if I were building this other alternative system over here. And then a lot of CIOs are going, well, help me out here. I am really good technically, and I've had a whole career in being a smart technical person and helping to lead the IT department to do the important things that this company needs in the IT world, but I'm not, my strong suit is not corporate politics, my strong suit is not 
communicating with the other CXOs in the country, my in the company, my strong suit is not um, building relationships that are cooperative with those other CXOs. Again, if you do IT governance properly, this will all be history. You'll you'll take your proper place with the stature that you need among those doing strategic business planning in the company uh, and will be a valued um, member of that team. Okay, so this is quite a promise. This is the promise of IT governance. Now the next question that we have for discussion here is what is IT governance? Some people might define IT governance as just getting the other CXOs in the company to help you prioritize what systems you should be spending money on. No. If that's all IT governance is to you, then I make some predictions. Basically, all these won't work right. If the only thing IT governance is to you is getting the CXOs together on a quarterly basis or monthly basis or however often you do it, so that they can work through the priorities and help you prioritize which IT initiatives you should be putting your resources into. If that's the only thing you're doing with IT governance, you're still going to have funding problems, major ones. You're not going to be cultivating the ownership and the cooperation you need on the part of the other CXOs. You're not going to get them to really participate in a constructive way. I mean, most of them are not going to show up for that meeting. I mean, if you're doing this, you will, you will know that. They're not coming to your meetings. And you won't actually have a very active role in this part of what's happening in the company. So IT governance has to be more than just collecting together the senior leadership of the company so that they can help prioritize and determine funding for major IT spends. What are the costs of IT governance? A lot of time on the part of the CIO. Some of the best CIOs that I've seen, best being defined as those having um, the greatest stature by the rest of the senior leadership team and the most impact on building stockholder equity in the company. Um, are CIOs that tell me things like, I spend about 30% of my time on IT governance. Now think about that. For some of you, that would be a radical thought. You're already putting in, what, 60 hours a week? Maybe 70, 80 in some cases? Let's just say 60. So if you're spending 30% of your time on IT governance, are these CIOs really spending on the average 20 hours a week, each and every week of their lives doing IT governance? Yep, that's their claim. And I would claim that's time well spent. That, that reflects proper priorities on the part of the CIO. We'll justify that as we go along. All right, so we ask, do you really believe the promise of IT governance? Well, probably not for most people viewing this video at this point. Many of the things that I've been promising you, based on these initial introductory remarks, you're sitting there with a certain amount of incredulity as you watch this and go, I don't think so. Well, been doing this a long time. Watched a lot of CIOs, helped a lot of CIOs. Um, I'm, I'm telling you what my experience and observations are. So hang with me and let's think about this together and let's see if IT governance can't be something more than um, what, what perhaps you've been struggling with so far. So what are the major challenges and issues and obstacles that face a typical CIO? Um, or if you are not a CIO, if your title is IT director, but you're the top IT person in the company, okay. But what are the major obstacles that face you? Well, time, we've talked about that. Communication skills, relationship building skills. Proper understanding of the business model, the the levers and the business strategy, a seat at the table. 
so that you're part of the team who plans the business strategy. Those all become challenges that face a CIO. You have to have those in order to do IT governance properly. Okay, the question is which of those challenges and issues and obstacles are addressed or resolved by proper IT governance? I would argue all of them are. So here's another definition of IT governance. To achieve success in this information economy, governance of IT is a critical facet of enterprise governance. So at this point we see that IT governance is actually just a subset of corporate governance or an enterprise governance. Good IT governance assists enterprise leaders in their responsibility to ensure that IT goals align with those of the business. All right, so now we've introduced this notion of IT alignment. So proper IT governance helps accomplish IT alignment. That's an interesting realization. I would argue you can't actually do IT alignment without a good, robust, healthy IT governance process. Okay. And uh, it delivers value. We'll talk a little bit about what that value is. Again, in terms of value here, we're talking about increased profits in the company. So by doing IT governance right, you are going to see significant increases in corporate profits. Okay. Its performance is measured. You won't be guessing at what those profit increases are. You will have measured them. Its resources are properly allocated and its risks mitigated. Okay, so there's an interesting definition of IT governance. Now, question, who initiates IT governance? Well, the answer traditionally is one of two people in the company. Either the CIO initiates it, or if the CIO is sleeping at the switch, the CEO may initiate it. Again, if the CEO has come to you and said, you need to be doing IT governance, or you need to be doing it better, or we need to be doing it differently, or shouldn't IT governance be doing something for us that ours isn't, um, none of those are really good news for the CIO. Um, it basically means you've got to do something to pretty significantly revamp your IT governance process. And the last question on this slide is who manages IT governance? Well, regardless of who initiated it, it's the CIO's job to manage it. Now, there's an interesting website out at ITGI, that's itgovernanceinstitute.org. Um, there's a lot of interesting information out there that you might find useful. Uh, it's a good reference uh, for IT governance. All right, so I hear from a lot of CIOs when they start to get the picture that IT governance is going to take a huge amount of their time and effort. Um, they sometimes toy with the idea of, well, why should I go there? Why should I do it? Why should I make my IT governance program that big or that involved? Um, and they want to they want to do a sort of a skinny version of it. Well, let me talk for a minute about being more purposeful and systematic about involving uh, the line users at the CXO and head of business unit levels in taking ownership of IT projects. One of the issues that gets resolved when you do that is the fact that you're going to get better funding stabilization. Now what do we mean by funding stabilization? Well, <clears throat> How often has it been that you've had some very large IT initiative get approval for funding from the CFO and you start into it and part way into it, you're not very far along, and the CFO cancels the funds or postpones them for another year and you sort of have to put that project on hold? Well, that's an example of unstable or destabilized IT funding. If you're doing IT governance, rarely will you see that happen, if ever. Uh, because the CFO no longer is allowed to view an IT project as an expenditure. 
Instead, the CFO now has to view major IT projects as consensus decisions by the company leadership for how investment and the future of the company is going to be built. It makes it much more difficult for the CFO to zero out a budget line item on the IT budget that way. Also, let's uh, looking at this second bullet here, better end user involvement means better system requirements, feedback, less criticism. Let's review what the life cycle of a major IT project looks like. So we start with a business concept. In other words, we want an IT system built because it's going to provide the following business advantage. It's going to make sales increase in the new e-commerce system, or it's going to improve efficiencies in the way we do production, or it's going something. Something that's valuable to the business, that's the business concept. All right. So once the business concept is, <coughs> um, is verbalized, is uh, proposed, you now do a requirements analysis. This is where your system analysts start meeting with the business line people and they're trying to put together a set of requirements, specifically what is this IT system supposed to accomplish. This then gives way to the specs. What are the specific specifications um, that, have, that the software has to accomplish? Um, this will list the features, etc. Right. This then is going to come up for the funding decisions. So let's say by the time we do the specs, we're sitting here looking at this and go, well, this project's going to cost $3.5 million or $35 million or $350 million. I mean, whatever the size of your company is that makes an IT project look like a big IT project. Um, so. <clears throat> Now what? Well, you go to the CFO sometimes at this point, and the CFO goes, what? I don't have that much money. What if I only gave you half as much? So now back to the drawing boards, figure out how we could reduce the specs um, so that we can get this thing funded. I mean, however that process works in your company, but basically this is the funding question. Then <clears throat> from here, we do the development. This is where the software and hardware people go to work to build the system. Okay, so this is where the, if you will, the coding happens, to use an old IT term. Then after development, we're going to go through some set of testing. Now, I don't want to get into a lot of detail here, but we do verification, we do validation, we do end user acceptance testing. You have test plans for that, you have, it's on the schedule, you make all this happen. You're, you're verifying against um, the specs and you're validating against the business requirement and the end user testing is trying to determine, is this going to be acceptable to the end users? Are they really going to use it? All right. Then, then we go to the implementation phase, which these days tends to go by the term change management. This is the point where the users, the intended users of this new IT system have to change the way they've been doing things. Otherwise, your IT system becomes shelfware. How do you manage that change? How do you get the intended users to start using the system, to quit doing it the way they used to do it and start doing it the way they are supposed to start doing it? For example, um, a lot of CIOs today have some recent experience in rolling out a CRM system. Well, CRM systems um, need the customer service people and sometimes the sales people to provide uh, constant input 
of what's happening during the conversations with customers. What happens if they're not taking the time to do that? Your CRM system is going to be able to accomplish a very minor uh, part of what it could have accomplished. Um, that would be an example of where change management wasn't done very well. All right, and then after change management, uh, we have the maintenance phase followed by eventually retirement. Okay, so this is what the life cycle looks like for an IT system. Now, let me ask a question here. <clears throat> Which ones of these stages of the life cycle would get better if the CIO had some other CXO in the company to own the project? Not just sponsor it. Again, we're not talking about sponsorship. We're talking about owning it. This is their project. And you're coming along as a CIO in support of their project. Okay, so the sales guy is taking ownership of the new sales tracking and forecasting system or um, the customer service guy, the C, if his boss is the COO, the COO is taking ownership of the new CRM system or whatever, it's, it's so on and so forth. Um, so <clears throat> do you sometimes have difficulty getting the sort of cooperation that you need from the, the line business people to put the right valuation on the real business value of this new project. Um, if you don't, you're not normal. Uh, that would be a typical challenge that faces a CIO early on in trying to define the value and therefore the justification and do the proper prioritization for whether or not this project gets built. Well, if that project is owned by somebody from the business unit, this is going to get a lot easier to do. Because all of a sudden, you have somebody from the business unit working with you to do the valuation of what the business value is going to be for the company. How about the requirements analysis? How, how often have you seen a situation where you send your system analysts over to talk to somebody over in ops about what the requirements of this new system is supposed to do, and it kind of goes like this. I mean, you're scheduled to be there from 9 to 10. The guy shows up a half an hour late. He says, you know, I have a, don't have a lot of time for this today. You have a few quick questions for me. <clears throat> and he's, he's out of there 10 minutes early off to his next appointment, and what was supposed to be an hour-long meeting is a 20-minute long meeting, and the next one just sort of gets canceled or postponed. And pretty soon, your systems analyst people are trying to do the best they can with not enough information. And uh, that's, again, not unusual. All right, so <clears throat> what's the difference? If the person you're meeting with, if the senior level manager that you're meeting with uh, is over in ops and the COO is the owner of this project, all of a sudden, that senior level ops manager is not viewing this as an IT thing. And this is just sort of an interruption in his day. He's now viewing it as a major initiative that belongs to his boss. He's going to be a lot more engaged in making sure that the requirements get done right. And so this part is also going to improve. Specs, same deal. Same issues as getting the requirements, and that's going to improve. <clears throat> now, how about the funding? Well, how often are CIOs trying to make the case to the CFO, sort of just the two of them, and, uh, and trying to get approval for funding, and the CFO goes, you know, I just don't have the money in the budget this year. We, we're just going to have to put that off to a later year. Well, what happens if that COO owner is in that meeting with you, the CFO, and the COO owner is arguing for funding of the project. And he's laying out the business case. And, and now the CFO is 
doesn't just have to say no to the CIO, which is usually a fairly easy thing to do, but he's got to now say no to the COO. That's a lot harder thing to do. Plus, the COO has a much bigger budget than the CIO does. And therefore, there's a lot more maneuver room inside the COO's budget to find that money um, if this is an important enough project for the COO. So funding is improved and funding stabilization, as we've already said. How about the development or coding part? You know what? <clears throat> Nobody outside IT wants to play in this space. So this is going to be just the same. Whatever would have happened during the development, the technical development of the system is still going to happen exactly the same way. The CIO is going to be calling all the shots or one of his IT directors or project managers. And the folks in the business unit are rarely going to be involved in this other than to give feedback on how the prototypes are coming along. So if you're doing some sort of agile development, some sort of iterative prototyping, process. As each of those prototypes gets done, they're going in front of the COO now. This is not something he doesn't have time for, you can't get on his calendar. This is a primary initiative that he's responsible for, so he's going to be there. He and his people will be there helping you to evaluate this, making sure that what's good about the prototype gets recognized and what's not good about the prototype gets noted and therefore changed way, way early. Not something that you have to do after you've implemented this and you're wondering why the change management isn't going very well. Okay, so how about the testing part? Well, the verification and validation will remain unchanged, but the user acceptance testing, which is going to boil over into the change management program now, this is going to get a lot better. Why? Well, if what you're doing is, let's say, fielding a new CRM system to customer service people, If they're not real impressed with the system, it's pretty hard to get them to use it because they're viewing this as an IT initiative. Ah, but now if the COO, their boss's boss's boss, owns this thing, there's a lot of emphasis inside customer service to use this new system. They are, they are now going to see their performance reports directly impacted by how well they're cooperating with helping to make the boss's boss's boss successful and all the bosses between them and him or her um, respectively. All right, so we're going to see change management get a lot easier. How about the maintenance phase? Well, there's going to be less of it. Why? because we did a better job way up here on the requirements and the specs part. And even during development with those prototypes, getting them properly evaluated so that we're building the right system first time out of the box, there's less maintenance to do here. So this is actually going to be improved. Fewer resources, higher quality. Okay, and who cares about this? <clears throat> so when we look at the whole life cycle of a major IT expenditure and we asked we asked the question what does ownership by another CXO do to improve the quality and usability and business value of the systems that IT is providing for the company it's huge it's huge once you see this picture it would be downright irresponsible for a CIO not to pursue this model. So now, that raises the question. How do you go about getting CXO ownership? Um, that takes some doing in a lot of organizations. They don't want, sometimes, I certainly have seen this many times, uh, that COO or that CMO or that VP of sales uh, doesn't want the added responsibility and the added accountability of a major new business initiative. There's got to be something in it for them that's so powerful and so compelling that they do want to take ownership of that. So that's part of what the CIO has to do here, is have the discussions that are going to sell this 
to the business unit owner. So as the CIO goes through this process, as the, the process of gaining ownership for these major expensive IT initiatives, we're going to see both the increased perception and reality of IT, meaning the CIO here, being a quality service provider. Also, the perception and the reality that the CIO or whatever the title is of the top IT person in your organization has an executive business mind. Does the rest of the leadership team in the company look at you that way now? Do they see you as having a well-honed, fine-tuned executive business mind? Or do they kind of think of you as that's just the IT guy? And it's going to increase the perception and reality that the CIO is an executive team player, obviously. You're not just the IT guy. You become a central part of the leadership team of the company. They can't do without you. They know you're indispensable as part of the leadership team, not just indispensable as the guy who provides good IT services. All right, so now let's consider the downsides and cautions in a little bit more depth. Uh, obviously, it's going to take more time and energy up front, but it's important to recognize that even though it takes more time and energy up front, it's going to take less redo and wasted time and resources in the long run um, and more likely provide successful systems that are achieving higher business advantage. It requires effort to hone executive communication skills I've worked with a lot of CIOs over the last decade, a lot of CIOs, and I understand that for the most part, I mean as a group, CIOs could use um, more executive communication skill. So that's something that you'll have to work on developing. It's very good for your career uh, progression, for your compensation, for your longevity at your current company or for superior opportunities with other companies. So it's a, it's a very valuable professional skill to be working on, but you're going to have to develop that um, for most of you a, a, good bit a good bit farther and deeper as a skill set than um, you may have done up to this point must be presented in a positive light or it might be perceived as dodging responsibility so <clears throat> you can't you can't be like a bull in a china closet here you can't just walk up to the other cxos and go hey you really want to take ownership of this major new initiative um, and 95 percent of all the money that's going to be spent on this is going to be spent inside it but i want you to take ownership of this because it has these great advantages to it that's not going to work, or rarely would that work. Um, so it's going to sort of be like a dating relationship. I mean, you know, you don't you don't walk up if you're a guy, you don't walk up to a girl, or if you're a girl, you don't walk up to the guy and go, "Hey, want to go out for a date and then get married afterwards?" I mean, that's not the way that happens. Um, it's a process. It's a courting ritual. Um, as both sides get more used to the idea and what's in it for them and become increasingly committed to the proposition, that's more the way it feels in engaging the business unit owners and taking ownership of these major IT initiatives. Yep, a lot of work, but it is worth it and it is the job of the CIO to do that. And for <clears throat> the other people on your IT governance board, meaning the other senior leaders in the corporation, their time's already short and their plates are already full. And so the question is, how are you gonna get them to become engaged in another responsibility? Um, obviously, there's gonna have to be something in it for them. So we want to suggest this is somebody's definition of IT governance. It is the decision rights and accountability framework for encouraging desirable behavior in the use of IT. What does that mean? <clears throat> decision rights. In other words, 
who gets the right to make the decisions about what happens with the IT budget? Well, let me go back to the board here and show you um, something that I think is important for a CIO to realize. Okay, back to the basic business equation. Revenue minus expenses equals profit. Let's just say you're a billion dollar company and you're running a 10% profit margin. What that means is that your expenses are adding up to 900 million and you're producing 100 million in profits. <clears throat> Now, typically, the IT budget is going to be running somewhere in the neighborhood of 3% of revenue. It's going to depend on the type of industry that you're in, on the size of the company, on your strategy. But as a general rule, uh, we normally expect, when we're looking at a billion-dollar company, to see about 3% revenues uh, being put into IT. All right. So 3% of a billion dollars, the IT budget here is going to be running about 30 million. Now 30 million is what percentage of 100 million? 30%? In other words, the IT budget is 30% of the profits in this situation, but that's not at all atypical. So the question is, when you're approaching the other senior leadership, you could really be asking the question, are you important enough around here to decide what's supposed to happen with 30% of the company's profits? Ha, huh, wow, that's a lot different question. That's a hugely different question, and that's really getting to this notion of decision rights who has the right, who has the obligation, who's important enough around this place to be involved in deciding what's going to happen with 30% of the company's profits, or what would be 30% of the company's profits. All right, and the accountability framework. The question here is, are you, as part of the leadership team, interested in being part of the company's leadership who's holding the CIO accountable for what he or she is doing with 30% of the company's profits. In other words, are you important enough around here to be part of the senior leadership group who's providing this necessary accountability over such a significant chunk of, of our expenditures? All right. So, when we put it like that, IT governance becomes something that is justifiable to the rest of the leadership team in terms of their involvement in the process, whatever that process is going to look like. We'll talk about that process uh, later in this lecture. All right, so the next question is, is, what's the business imperative for IT governance? And how strong is that business imperative? Well, a few years back, the MIT folks completed study that took them three years. They looked at 250 different companies of all sizes, small, medium, and large, in 23 different countries. And it was really a study all about IT governance. And what they were looking at is who's doing it, who's not doing it, what is the difference based on the particular industry sector they're in in terms of the profitability of those companies that are doing IT governance versus those companies that are not doing it, which ones are doing it the best, what does that look like. So that was really uh, the, the focus of this study. And as you can imagine, the results uh, were eye-opening. They showed that good governance yields an average of 20% higher return on assets. Well, another way to say that is 20% increase in what otherwise would have been the profits. So a 20% increase in profits. So in this example, if we do IT governance properly and we just have an average return, 
we're going to see the profits of the company go from 100 million a year to 120 million a year simply because we did IT governance right. Now, for some of you, you're going, huh? Where's that money coming from? How is that going to happen? Well, hold on. We, if you've already watched the IT alignment lecture, you know where that money is coming from. Uh, we've already explained it in there. Um, but for the, for the sake of this lecture, we're just talking about IT governance. And here's an interesting study that says, oh, by the way, it really does work. It really does make business sense to do this. All right, so part of the CIO's um, argument to the CEO, <clears throat> why should we be doing IT governance? Why should we get the whole leadership team involved in this? Well, do you want a 20% increase in profits? And oh, by the way, that's 20% if we just have an average implementation. What if we do even better in the way we do IT governance than the average? Well, then we should expect to see that number go not 20% higher, but something greater than that higher. All right, so now let's talk about ways to do IT governance. There are four basic models that we teach at the Institute for CIO Excellence. Uh, there is the classical model, there is the Caldwell model, there is the Ruth model, and there is the ERM model for enterprise risk management. Now, what we have with this set of these four models is basically the standard methodologies and practices used throughout um, business and industry for how IT governance is done. And most companies are using one of these four models. They may not know it, but they are. Um, but, but most are purposefully using one or more of these models. All right, so on this next slide, um, we see that the classical uh, model for IT governance has the following components. It includes a steering committee of senior IT and business executives. And by the way, that's the only thing that's common to all four models of IT governance is they all have this executive steering committee. Sometimes we call it the IT governance board. We also are going to, in the classical model, in the classical model only, set up these self-directed work teams um, made up of both IT people and business people. We're going to establish boundaries of what each of these self-directed work teams can and should be focused on. Uh, one of these self-directed work teams is going to be um, an architectural council that sets corporate IT standards. Um, and then we have these six principles, and I'll just flip the slide up here for you to look at those, and then I will talk through this on the board.